Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Zon Academy. I'm Fran Parathiris with Zon Education, and today we have a great webinar at hand. Welcome to Jimmy Stegall, who is the Procedural Solutions Specialist for Dentsply Serona, and we're going to be discussing Lucitone uh, digital print dentures, resins, and best workflows. We will have a couple of poll questions coming up. Uh, so we'd love it if you'd be interactive with us and answer a few of them. And also, Jimmy will be taking questions at the end. So please type them in at the bottom of your screen at the Q&A uh, section. Everybody, here's Jimmy, and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much. Um, why don't we pop up the first poll question now, right? So we can kind of get a feel for the audience. Absolutely, Jimmy. This one is describe yourself with which best describes you. If you would please answer these uh, questions now. Thank you. We'll keep this up for a minute, Jimmy. All right. Then I will uh, give you the results. Very good. All right. So while that is going on, I will move to the first section, right? So we're going to talk about today, we're going to be comparing, you know, traditional to uh, uh, digital uh, because, you know, there's a lot of labs out there still deciding. And just, so folks will know my background. I worked uh, for a great lab for 40 years. And one of my roles was to, you know, make sure that we were, you know, uh, effective, functional, um, productive. And, you know, I'm one of those guys who believes that uh, what gets measured gets done. So uh, in the tasks that we were doing, you know, of course, we have a computer system that tracks everything. So it's a great way to know how the lab is producing and how long it takes you to do things. So I measured everything and, and it wasn't that, you know, we wanted to demand that our technicians created X number of things per day. We just wanted to know what we were capable of. So I have a whole program, you know, on this cost analysis of, you know, what it costs to make a denture and how much time and all that. And I'm going to show you just a couple of pieces of it today, um, because when digital came into the forefront, uh, it was my first thought was to go compare it to what um, analog means. So we all know these steps and know what it takes. And, you know, there's been a lot of folks that have measured and analyzed these steps. And uh, honestly, this is the way most labs are still doing it. This is the way you and I learned, right? We, we learned how to handle wax and flames and, and, and nothing to diminish this. I think this is a skill set that's, you know, unbelievably talented to be able to select teeth and put them in the right place and, you know, create the anatomy and the wax. And, and I felt, learned early on that, you know, somebody that's doing this processing step is a critical to the success. So you got to be good at this. And, you know, this is just kind of how we did it for years. Now we got better over the years with our systems, like, you know, moving from this, the press packing over to injection, you know, with things like, like um, Ivacap. And that made it better, but still acrylic is fraught with the nuances that creates problem for us, whether it's processing errors or shrinkage expansion. And then, of course, all the manual steps, right? Everything that's in this video takes a pretty set of skill of hands. And, and as we all know, the, these skill sets are very difficult and challenging to find. So what I saw in the digital workflow was a solution to that, um, not a replacement for that, but a solution for that. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. So you know, what kind of audience do we have? What do our results come out to be? Okay, Jimmy, we have the results. 47% are lab owners or managers. 37% oh. 30, are technicians. And 50% are either sales or marketing specialists looking to learn some more. Perfect. Perfect. So um, we're right in track with our topics today. So what I did after, you know, in, in our lab, we were doing about 100 dentures a day. So um, you know, we had a lot of data and, and I timed everything. And again, not to press somebody and say, hey, you need to do your setup in less than 20 minutes. No, 20 minutes is kind of where we average. And it doesn't mean that, that you know, that you, you got fired if you didn't do it in 20. And because there are days that cases are hard or tough or, you know, the dog guys or whatever that causes problems. But overall, this is a good average. And, you know, I've looked at manufacturer surveys of this and, you know, talked to other lab owners that, you know, this is pretty normal that, you know, we're looking at about an hour and a half to two hours of hands-on time to traditionally fabricate a denture. And then you start looking at hourly pay and, you know, what we pay people to do each of those steps. And this is the way our lab was set up. You know, we had a model person, a setup person that just placed the teeth and set up wax and then a waxing person that did the festooning and carving of wax. 
and, and then a processing technician, and then finally a finish and polish. So five teams, you know, and our goal based on our times over the years was 24 arches a day. Doesn't mean we always did it. Sometimes we did more, sometimes we did less, but overall, you know, that's a target, you know, and, and if you do the math and time all this out, you know, you can see that if I want my processor to do 24 arches, that it would take him 10 hours. Does that mean that we had uh, processors that work 10 hour days? No, we wanted everybody to work eight hour days and go home and be with their families. But what it meant was that um, other folks would help like the model person, right? We didn't want them to go home after four hours. So the model person helped the investor processor clean flasks, you know, do simple tasks, things like that. And the wax person as well, right? A couple hours left over to help the setup person pick teeth. And so you kind of share things and nothing's ever locked in stone. And so you got to have some flexibility within teams and the type of cases that you have. But these are the average numbers. So once you have those numbers over time, you can start to look and say, okay, this is what it costs me. And so we did like most everybody does running a lab. You know, we want to know what labor overhead materials cost, you know, what our gross profit is. And, and all that means is I'm not factoring in uh, taxes, interest, depreciation. So this is what, you know, folks look at as, as an EBITDA number. And a gross profit on a $301 denture of $192 is okay. That's a good living. And, you know, it's kind of the standard. It has been the standard for a while. Now, 301 is a little low now. I think the average is a little bit higher than that. But this is our foundation. So this is what we want to look at when we start looking at digital. How does this compare to digital, right? The time, you know, the pay rate, and of course, the, the profit margin or, or the retail cost you know, to create that profit margin. And we'll come back to that later after we learn about, you know, the materials. So I'm going to show a video now, and after the video, there'll be a poll, but this is a video overview of the Lucitone digital print system, and I will talk it through, right, as it's playing, so that you'll have an idea, right, and this is a new resin, right, it's been only out for four years now, it is a polymer resin, not an acrylic, and we have now uh, developed uh, tooth resins as well as base resins, so you know, it's here, the system is here and it is a fully validated system. All steps and processes are FDA validated, right? So from the design to the finish, um, you can feel confident, right? When this system's in your lab that you, you're following all protocols and you're covered just in case the FDA ever shows up. So it is a full system and we have all the shades, uh, multiple shades of base, plus all 16 shades of teeth. And, you know, there's not a denture case that you cannot do with our system now, which has been limiting with digital denture workflows. And uh, we think we've brought the complete system to the market. And so from here, you know, the things can only get better. And printing is the way it's going, guys. If you aren't aware, it's just absolutely taking over not only our industry, but other industries as far as manufacturing goes. So we have to start thinking about this a little different. Our mindset needs to change about how we've made things in the past and how we need to make things. Now, that doesn't mean we need to compromise, right? We still expect the quality um, and aesthetics and strength that we've always had or better. And uh, thankfully, with these new systems, we can get that. So again, it just becomes a transfer of processes, uh, learning new processes, and learning how to fit that into your lab. And most importantly, uh, scalability, right? How can I grow? Because the demand is here. Um, you're experiencing it. Every lab's experiencing it, right? Can't get the dentures done. And we all know we can't find people. So um, digital is the answer to that. And, you know, we've just got to learn how to fit within that workflow. So, you know, before I start talking specifically about um, the system, let's look at this survey and see, you know, why uh, are you interested or what brought you to this point to come watch uh, the webinar on the Lucitone digital print specifically, because there are other systems out there. So take a second and, and then look at these options and pick your vote and uh, we will bring that back up in a second, right? So while you're talking or, or you know deciding that answer, let's look across the bottom, right? Across the bottom is the graphical representation of what the process is, right? You, you got to scan something and that scan could be a lab scanner, but it could also be an intraoral scanner. You got to have a piece of software to create the denture, right? And you can do that in ExoCAD, 3Shape or in lab. Um, there are various versions of try-ins in the digital denture workflow. So we're going to create a try-in, we're going to print that or mill that, and then we're going to move to the final and the steps associated with that. 
you know, we talk with our dentist and teach the clinical workflows for that. And then and it was just a matter of deciding materials, right? What tooth material do I want to use in the dentures I'm making? You pick a tooth material, you go through that workflow, and then finally you put it in a curing unit and the denture is done. So we are literally taking the steps and changing our world about how we make dentures. And the good news is the results are all better than what we had before. And it can be um, aesthetically as good or better than what we've had before just by taking the skills that some of you already have and know and just using a new tool to do it with. So um, survey complete yet, Zon buddies? Not quite. Yes. Yes, the survey is complete, and the results are 13% are current users looking for updates. Okay. 38% are analog denture labs thinking about going digital. 19% are seeking solutions to help with denture production problems. 13% are considering adding removable products and services to their current services. Wow. And 19% are already doing digital dentures, but are looking for something new. Pretty good mix and a pretty large percentage of folks like maybe a Crown Bridge Lab looking to add dentures, which, by the way, digital is a great way for you to do it because it doesn't require, you know, as much pre-preparation to make it happen because you're already familiar with digital workflows. So let's talk about the materials themselves. Lucitone Digital Print, again, is a full system, fully validated system, start to finish, FDA clearance on everything in this process. And it's not a complicated system. Uh, we have a one liter bottle of base resin with the blue stripe. We have a one liter bottle of what we call value resin, which can be used to print a monolithic try-in of your design, or it's been validated as well to be printed as denture teeth. The smaller half liter bottle is our digital premium resin, digital IPN. Um, it can be used for denture teeth. And then the three bottles to the right is our Lucetone Digital Fuse system. It's what we use to bond the teeth to the bases. And then we've added the multi-layer PMMA. We had it validated as a denture tooth material as well. So you could use, if you have a spare milling machine and not a printer, you could actually be milling your denture teeth out of a PMMA. And then of course we have the carded teeth. That's where we started. So Let's talk about the base first. Lucetone Digital Base is a polymer resin. It's not 199. It's not an acrylic at all. It's a totally different chemistry, but that brings with it some physical properties that's really beneficial to us. And the first and foremost being strength. So, you know, we've seen for years the words high impact on our boxes of acrylic, you know, whether it be, you know, Fricky or, or Lucetone or Avocap, you know, that those words exist, high impact, and they exist because manufacturers have sent their dentures to be tested. And the FDA said, okay, if your denture doesn't break before 900 joules per meter squared, when we put it in an Instron and, and, and push it or stretch it, um, you can put the words high impact on your box. So 900 is the bar. Most acrylics that we've used um, are in the 1,000 to 1,200 joules per meter squared, so well above the bar, and that's why we see high impact on all our boxes. Uh, this resin also qualified for a high impact designation in that it does not break until 1,500 joules per meter squared, so a little bit stronger than most any acrylic on the market. Now, when you go through FDA validation with a product that's going to be used in the mouth, you need to and have to test it uh, at mouth temperature as well. So Boston University did all the validations for dent supply, and this resin at mouth temperature went to 3,000 joules per meter squared. It literally doubled in strength when it's warmed up to 96 to 98 degrees. Um, that's incredible, right? Now, now we're looking at three times the strength of acrylic and the strength numbers that we're talking about is against fracture, which is you know how dentures break. So it's pretty exciting, right? The first thing I thought of was all the maxillary dentures that, that broke in the midline or all the locator uh, lower dentures that broke and how beneficial having a resin like this would be. So, you know, validations are important and, and research and you know, universities that do that is important. And so the testing at Boston is one thing, but, you know, rednecks in the South, we're going to test things our own way. So we take them out in the parking lot and, and do a quick test with our truck tire to see how they hold up. And as expected, acrylic dentures are going to break every time under that stress, but uh, loose stone digital dentures don't break very often. Now, nothing's unbreakable. Give me a minute and I'll break it, but it doesn't happen very often. Good news is that uh, even if they do break, uh, the teeth don't come out. The, the chemical system, the fuse system that our guys developed 
totally solve tooth pop out problems. I, I can't get a tooth out, guys. I literally will take pliers and try to remove them and can't get them out. If and when a denture actually breaks, the teeth still don't come out, right? It splits along with the base. So not worried about tooth pop outs. Now, most patients don't call and say, you know, they ran over it. Most say they did this, right? They dropped it in the sink and, you know, it'll break. And I love tossing these in sinks in front of patients and, you know, everybody gasps for a second and uh, it's all good. But um, so it's strong and no doubt about it. Now, the other thing that we would hear as lab guys is occasionally a new denture goes home uh, to a house and, you know, something in the house recognize that as a new object and they'd like to chew on it. So, you know, the dog finds it. So I've been giving these to Max for a couple of years to see what he could do. And, and Max probably doesn't qualify as a real dog to test, but he's not able to damage it either. And, you know, here we are in, at the university and in the Instron. And, you know, even before teeth are bonded, this stuff is pretty darn strong. Most acrylics uh, will break in the first millimeter or so of movement of the Instron machine. This one, you know, it went a pretty long way before it did break. So be confident in the strength that, you know, we have developed a resin that's super, super strong. So strength is number one, which is great. The next thing that you're going to really love about this is that this is, uh, I think, the only, if not one of the only resins, 3D resins on the market that you can pour into a printer without having to shake it or mix it or put it on a roller machine or in an ultrasonic or anything to get it prepared to print. It literally is unscrew the cap and, and put it in the printer. It has a three-year shelf life after you open the cap. So, you know, we don't really worry about shelf life. And so it's easy to use in the lab. Um, polishing, um, like any other polymer resin, once it's cured, it's a denser, smoother surface. And so it's a, it's a joy to, to, to finish or polish. It, it When you cut on it, it's like um, composite. So it powders, it doesn't peel and roll like acrylic does. So I really enjoy finishing it. Now, the good news is because we're digital and we're creating our festooning and our shaping of our tissue in the software and you know, just printing that, there's very little finishing that needs to be done. It's really just a polish job. So um, this is where we gain a lot of time in a traditional acrylic setting, right? The finishing and polishing is at least a 30 to 40 minute, typically 45 to an hour to get all those steps done to get it ready to go. Um, here, you know, we take it out of the printer, we clean it, and we basically polish it, right? So it's like five or 10 minutes to get it ready. And we have even a new way that even supersedes that. So we'll talk about that. So it comes in five Lucitone shades, and those shades are matched to our old acrylic shades. So, you know, don't have to learn any new colors here. So uh, carded teeth, yeah, we introduced this line of teeth when we introduced the system, uh, but these are portrait teeth. These are made in the same place with the same chemistry as portrait. And the only reason we don't use portrait is because the backside, right? The, the portrait teeth and all other carded teeth are bulky. And you don't have the ability to grind down uh, a, a carded tooth when you're doing a digital denture. You know, otherwise a carded do you no good. So we had to create a tooth that was already ground down on the backside. And that's the only reason uh, for this tooth. And this allowed us to do it in more cases, but still limited us to cases that had, you know, a certain amount of room. So we, I see us moving away. I see labs moving away from carded teeth, you know, because of the stocking and, and the space and all that. And, you know, everybody's moving toward denture teeth that we create, right, in the software. So in order to create a denture tooth, number one, you have to have a library that's open, right? All carded libraries are closed. Number one, because morphing a carded tooth in the computer will do you no good because then again, the carded tooth is not fitting. So an open library says, okay, have at it, right? Create the denture tooth mold of your dreams and then go print it or mill it. And so our first step into that was the milling because we had this material on the shelf and all we had to do was get it validated as a denture tooth, multi-layer PMA for aesthetics, durability of most denture, good denture teeth on the market. And so that was a good answer. And, you know, you just had to have a milling machine and the time allowed. It takes about two, two and a half hours in most five axis machines to mill a whole puck of about three arches. But as I said earlier, most everybody's going to printing because of the ease and the cost and speed and all that. So our first uh, move into printing was with our loose stone digital value, which we already had. And we were using as a monolithic try-in material for a, a full denture. And we had it in six Vita shades. And so all we did was send it back to FDA to be validated as a denture tooth material. And uh, it tested really well. 
Um, but it's not as durable as the milled PMMA, certainly not as durable as the carded. So it would be a, you know, a step down in durability grade. Say, let's call this uh, uh, similar to our classic tooth, right? But a printed tooth nonetheless. But it, we only have six shades. Right. And so what we did with our libraries, um, we created libraries that are anatomized um, and that's unique to the digital denture tooth world. Right. Most every other digital version of denture teeth are basically reproductions of the carded teeth. Um, Densply took it to another level by giving our files to our ceramists in Germany and say, hey, you do things with porcelain to make it look better over metal copings, we need you to do that to these files so that denture teeth will look better when we print it in a monolithic resin. And we use two of our tooth lines to do that with, the Genios and the Portrait. And the Genios is just our European tooth. So it's a, you know, much like all the other popular European molds out there, like, you know, Avaclar, Vita, those things. So um, we've had this in Europe forever, but not digitally. So now we have it digitally and, and the portrait, everybody knows. So we have these libraries and we can now design our teeth. We can morph them. We can stretch them, shrink them, whatever we need to do to fit the situation and then print them. And the first time I printed one, I said, wow, that's actually pretty good. I did not expect a monolithic resin to give me some translucency and some appearance of mammalons, but that's due to the reflective and refractive quality of the resin, but also the digital libraries our guys work so hard to create. So I was pretty excited about this, but again, Durability, not where we'd really like it, right? This would be a denture tooth that might show some signs of wear in three years, five years, seven years. So we want something tougher. And so we went, you know, continued on with our development and we created the Lustone Digital IPN premium resin. And uh, so we expanded the set shades to uh, all 16 Vita shades plus two bleach shades, so 18 shades, right? And we developed a resin that uh, has even better optical qualities, right? Some things in there to give it that refraction we need. And we gave it the strength that we were used to, right? So if you use a portrait tooth today, this is a known number, right? And we know that, you know, only 0.09 uh, of the material loss happens on a carded portrait tooth, right? We know that, right? We test teeth, you know, for 80 years and we know that. We tested the printed tooth the same way. And uh, surprisingly to me, the printed resin tested identical. So this tooth is just as strong as a portrait tooth. When I say strong, I mean by wear. But if I look at the other two factors of, of modulus and flexural strength, it, it matches that as well. So this is literally portrait in a bottle. So this is a confidence factor for known strength and durability. And you're just not going to see the signs of wear, um, which is, by the way, you know, two to three times better than the other premium uh, tooth resins that are available on the market right now. So we kind of lead that way in that. So now we can uh, print base, print teeth, uh, bond them together and have a denture that's aesthetic, that's super strong, uh, a durability factor that's known. Portrait tooth has a lifetime warranty, right? And uh, we up the game on the libraries. We took the libraries we already had, the digital genios and the digital portrait, and we went to, to the ceramist again and they added more oomph, right? And I call it high def or the actual name would be HC for highly characterized. And so we added a little bit more detail, which took advantage of the optical qualities of the new resin. And we're able to create teeth that look like this out of a printer without any modification at all, right? You, you pick the library, you, you stretch it, morph it, put it in the position you want in your virtual tooth setting. And when you print it, it comes out like this with the translucency and the mammalons. And this is literally the best looking denture tooth that I've seen ever, you know, in my, in my 43 years. So pretty excited. The bottom picture will give you an idea of the difference in the two libraries, right? The standard library on the right, the highly characterized on the left, you know, just more oomph and really takes advantage of that, um, that resin. You know, so that's our materials, right? Base and teeth. The next step would be, all right, how we put them in the base, right? And that's where the Lucestone Digital Fuse, it's called Fuse for a reason. Right, the chemicals in these uh, fuse products are matched or identical in most ways to the base resin and the tooth resin. So we are literally getting a, a fuse of tooth to base, which is why I can't get it out with a pair of pliers. So there are three components. There's fuse one, fuse two, and fuse three. Fuse one is a conditioner, right? Um, I tell folks to think of it as an etchant, right? It really doesn't etch, but it creates a conditioned surface so that fuse two can stick to it better. 
right? And fuse two is the actual bonding uh, component. It is the resin we use to bond the teeth in. And it is foundationally the same as the base resin and has some other chemistry in it to enhance that bond. And fuse three is a oxygen barrier or sealer. And now the latest version of it is actually a glaze, which we'll talk about. So you can see here that I give it to folks all the time and say, take your biggest pair of pliers and have at it. And you're gonna break a tooth before you get it out. Now, this was our in, uh, curing unit at first. It's called the Speed Cure. Um, one of the things discovered early on that this resin needs a specific amount of heat. You know, any 3D resin's got to have a certain light wavelength. Everybody knows that, and that's easy to recreate or produce. What is hard, and no other commercially available unit was able to do it, so we kind of had to go back and modify the old Eclipse box to be able to do it, is the heat factor, right? This resin, being pretty unique and thicker than everybody else's, requires a high amount of heat, um, somewhere around the 180, 185 Fahrenheit. And no other curing unit on the market was doing that. So we, we had to have our own. That's a limitation to some folks because at the time this box cost like eight or nine grand, right? And that's, yeah, I got to buy another curing box specific to this resin. And yeah, unfortunately that's the case. Now we've added uh, another unit since then that's come down about half that price and it's using LEDs and heaters. So we're, we're getting better and we're actually introducing another unit in Chicago. You'll see it if you come by the Zon room when I do my table clinic, we'll have it on there and show you much smaller. It's only like about 12 by 12 by 15, uh, but it'll do um, five arches in 60 minutes. Whereas uh, our big unit we introduced a few months ago, will do nine arches in 90 minutes and but as a much bigger footprint. So we're, we're, we're coming out with options that are easier, faster, better uh, for your labs and option. And the smaller unit is going to be even less cost. So, you know, that's kind of the system of materials and equipment. And this QR code, um, again, I'll show you this one more time later, but this is our uh, portal, our Loosestone Digital Print portal, I call it, our learning site. This used to be available only if you were a customer of Loosestone Digital Print but it is now open to anyone and everyone. And I encourage you to go to this site so that you can uh, review our systems. All our training videos are in there, all the step-by-steps -step instruction guides. So, you know, you can look at the level just like as if you had the system, you know, to, to take a look at how it all work and how it might fit in your lab. So, um, you know, that's the materials. You know, let's talk about the, the workflow a little bit. Um, to make sure we stay on time. So the first step in any digital denture workflow is the design. And so you gotta have that software. Now we are predominantly oriented to three shape, um, but of course um, ExoCAD can be used, but ExoCAD uh, only has our uh, carded tooth library. So um, you would have to use one of ExoCAD's available denture tooth libraries, but it's certainly doable and you can use it with um, our resins. Uh, in lab, of course, you know, our software, um, has our carded library and the initial digital library, but not the highly characterized libraries yet. And, um, you know, if you're an in-lab user, you certainly could just add the denture module and move to that. So uh, we'll just talk about three shape for a second, right? With uh, carded teeth, there's a setup, right? We've got to set it up uh, a certain way. And, you know, we have our own uh, identifiers for what material settings you use and, uh, well, they're not ideally named because they can be confusing. Um, you know, it's just select the right material. Like for if I'm designing a denture with carded teeth, I got to make sure that for the tight material under the base, I pick DS um, print, right? And if I use a printed tooth, I got to pick DS arch print. So it's a little bit different name, but similar enough to get confused sometimes. So with three shape, it's pretty much all the steps are the same, regardless of the tooth workflow. We establish a clusal plane, we identify landmarks, we draw our borders, then we go to the screen that selects our teeth, we pick our mold, right, and we have mold charts for all of our libraries, carded and the uh, digital libraries. And then we get the teeth set in position and we then uh, wax our denture up. And the cool thing about the three shape wax up tool is that you can go from this style of wax up to this style of wax up with a simple mouse click. And I love that aspect. I used to have to do all this manually. Um, but most folks, again, are printing teeth. So, you know, this is what a printed tooth setup screen would look like. Um, I like to bridge my teeth in uh, three or four sections. Um, I have about stopped doing two three unit blocks in the anterior, just do one six unit block now um, to make it a little simpler for me. But if you do it that way, instead of one big block, it's actually easier. And, and you know, we talk about that in our training in depth. 
So, you know, see three simple steps, right? Pick the tooth, right? So all we have to pick here is our DS uh, library teeth and then pick our base, same base as before, but in here I'm saying DS arch print instead of DS print. And then of course, click the teeth I wanna to link together and click my bridge button, All right? So that's what that workflow looks like. Pretty simple, pretty quick, right? And, and good thing about our libraries, it doesn't matter if you're gonna print or mill, it's the same library and we put the DMEs to do both. So we're on the screen now picking teeth, right? So the only difference is, you know, I'm picking a open library, right? So this DSIPN 3D portrait inspired is my carded library, but here are my digital libraries. The word digital is the giveaway that this is an open library that I can actually work on these teeth and change them and modify them. So, you know, watch as I do this case, right? So I brought in this mold that I like. It's a little big for the ridge. So you see me squeeze it or compress it down uh, vertically and uh, laterally. Same mold, now it's just a little bit smaller. So maybe it's not a 70, maybe it's a mold 68 that really doesn't exist. The next thing I do is, you know, move teeth in quadrants, get them over the ridge, right? You know, get my overbite and over jet the way I want it. These are all three shape tools, right? This is a denture setup. This is exactly like, you know, traditional workflows where you do all this with your fingers and you just got to learn how to use a new tool, guys. That's all this is about, you know, is being more productive or effective with a new tool, but you still have the full capability with the tools 3Shape gives us to create, you know, the setup of your dreams. But the nice thing about it is that all of these denture tooth libraries come to us pre-occluded. So as long as we don't start monkeying around with individual teeth and moving them we, we can have established occlusion. If you notice how good and balanced that occlusion, all the yellow color all the way across the surface of those teeth, you know, assured me that I had a good balanced occlusion and I didn't have to set it, right? They set it for me. But if I want to get creative, as you saw, I moved some laterals and some cuspids a little bit. I certainly have that capability of, you know, creating my own setup, you know, but in the end, right, you, you end up with a denture that's a virtual denture, albeit, but it is a denture that I created just using different tools uh, because I'm just not really good with teeth and wax, but this, you know, with let, letting three shape carry some of the heavy lifting, you know, you can come out with a great result. And, you know, what this should start to create in your mind as a manager is scalability, right? I promise you, if you go to teach a, a new person how to set teeth traditionally, you know, it's a long haul. There's no doubt about it. It's probably going to be a year before, you know, they capture it well and two or three years before they're super productive and can handle any case. Teaching somebody how to set te teeth digitally, you know, we still have to know important things like where the retromobile pad is and size of the pill and all that. But um, I promise you, teaching somebody how to set teeth digitally is a lot faster. We can have them productive a lot quicker. So it makes it more scalable. Um, we are validated with uh, uh, the Asiga line of printers, you know, and uh, the carbon line as well is where we started. But, you know, it's moving quickly to Asiga, you know, because of open and scalability. And, you know, again, if you're going to be validated, you got to validate equipment as well. Uh, of course, we will continue to work on validation of other printers. But right now, this, this is the only printer systems that are, that are validated with our material. So with any printer system, you know, it all works kind of the same. We're going to upload our design. We're going to orient it. We're going to support it. Right. And, and there are specific parameters to this. And that's true with any material and printer out there. Right. They they're all have their own parameters. And, you know, when things go south and dentures don't print right, I always go back to, like, look, the, the IFUs that we give you have exactly the numbers you need to set in your Asiga composer, right, to make this work. And if you do that, you will not have any problems unless there's a problem with the printer. So we are specific about angles and where supports go and how you support them. But the nice thing about the Sega is you have a lot of options. Um, teeth, because they're printed almost horizontal, right? Um, and I print them in segments, they're not as tall, so they print faster. Right, so my posterior segments are at 20 degrees, my anterior segments are at 45. If you print a full arch, it's also at 45, but that'll be a taller um, job because of the supports needed to when you get it at 45 and you got to go from central to molar, it's just a bigger piece. So it takes a lot longer to print a full arch. Another reason I like printing in segments. Um, support the basal side. Uh, we've tried doing it on the occlusal side and found out that that method affects our occlusion even more. So it seems to be easier if you will support on the basal side. And then all you have to do down do then is smooth the supports on the basal. And that's pretty easy to do if you just kind of hold it and tilt it and look at it. So uh, print analysis is done by the software, the CAM software, and we send it off to printer. Coming out of the printer, you know, the, we go into the post-processing mode, right? And the post-processing mode involves step one, getting them off the printer, out of the printer. And the nice thing about our, our files for supports, they're, they're easy to get off, 
Um, I don't use a scraper unless I'm cleaning my platform, right? I can get them all off with my hand, which is fun. And then I can snap off the supports off the denture with my fingers. So I very rarely have to use the, the cutters to get any support off. So easy and quick. Um, cleaning is where, you know, we divert a little bit. Um, uh, there are a lot of cool uh, uh, alcohol wash baths out there and I've tried most of them unfortunately because our resin is so thick right it's so thick which gives us the ability to just open the cap and pour it in the printer not have to mix it it's also difficult to get the surface layer of that resin off after printing and we have found the ultrasonic is absolutely positively the best and most predictable way so we like most require two baths but we require two baths of clean alcohol so um, because an ultrasonic, right, got water in the ultrasonic and only about three or four ounces of alcohol in that jar, I don't use near as much ultrasonic uh, alcohol as what uh, you might be using in one of the orbital shakers or one of the um, spinning bath washers I see out there. I've tried all of them, guys, and I can assure you that nothing works as effective as an ultrasonic. And uh, you know, everybody has one at the lab or they're pretty easy to obtain these days. And just go through two baths. And I always use do this step is important, right? A brush step between bath one and bath two. But when you use an ultrasonic, this step takes 30 seconds. When you use any other device, this step will take you three or four or five minutes because it's loosened, but it's still on the surface. Ultrasonic gets it off and gets it out into the alcohol where it should be. So we do the brush, we put it in clean alcohol and do another. And again, two minutes and one minutes when I'm using ultrasonic. I use anything else, it's three minutes and two minutes. Um, it just takes more effort with the other machines. So, you know, if it's teeth, right, I, I just dump them all in one jar, right, and then run it for two minutes, take it out, and you'll see me. I got time in those two minutes to start cleaning that platform. But when I take these teeth out of the jar, right, I get them out all of the alcohol first. You don't want to leave any resin in the alcohol too long, right? It always makes me cringe up when I see a tech walk away from this step because if you leave it in the alcohol four, five, six, 12, 13 minutes, you're going to start changing your part. But you see a quick brush of all those parts, drop it into clean alcohol and, you know, do it again. All right. And one more bath and then take a quick look at it. And it's pretty much done at that point. Uh, with basis, what I'm going to do is um, dry it off really well. Sorry. When we don't clean it well, this is what happens. All right. So after our last cleaning bath, we dry it with our air syringe really, really good so that anything left will show up and we can go back and do it a quick scrub again. If we don't and we miss it, this is what happens. And unfortunately, this may not happen right away. Um, when you cure the denture, it might take a day or two for this to show up because what it is is unset resin or dirty alcohol subsurface. And when we cure it, we kind of seal it in and it may not show up until it dries or self cures on its own a few days later. So in order to compensate for this, we've just got to clean them good. And so this is one area of the protocol you have to follow pretty religiously to avoid that. So after that, then it's a simple fit uh, fit check, right? And so with carded teeth, it's simply take it out of the card and make sure they fit the sockets, right? Make sure I got the right card. With milled or printed, it's take them out of the pocket, or take them out of the printer and remove those nibs, right? So it's got to smooth those nibs down a little bit and then go over here and dry fit. This step, when we mill a full arch or print a full arch, right? Getting it to dry fit, right? You can see here that, you know, I'm not there yet, right? And you could spend 20 minutes, you know, smoothing and grinding on the underside of that to get to that point. A full arch has just got more angles, more areas of attack. So it's going to take you longer to do that. When I went to segments, right, that time went way down. I went from 10 to 15 minutes down to five minutes to get these seated. So all I have to do is smooth down those little nibs on the basal edge of that tooth. So you can see in this video, right, I'm doing an upper and lower arch and I'm using a soft rubber finned instrument, right? Not super aggressive, but aggressive enough to get the nibs off, but not so aggressive that, you know, I run a high risk of taking too much tooth away. And you can see I'm going through seven arches here and I'm just smoothing all the nibs down. And then after I smooth them all down, then I go back and dry fit. And you can see that I'm happy. I'm not picking up the handpiece again. So it's not a hard thing to do. You would have thought in that many segments, I would have had to pick up the handpiece at least once, but I didn't because it's a pretty easy thing to do. Once I have them all dry fitted, then it's time to do the second major step, which is our seat tack and seal step. Now with carded teeth, right, we're going to have to condition those teeth first, right? So they go in this little can and get fuse one poured over them. And with mill teeth, it's the same way. And, and the way to, to, to remember this is that this milled puck has already been fully baked and cooked somewhere else. It's 100% cured. 
the carded teeth, of course, are 100% baked. So in order to help something stick to it, I've got to condition it first. I've got to etch it first. All right, so I have to condition it with this product. And we have that little warmer plate that you use it on. And it takes about three minutes. After that, we take them out, let them air dry, and we're ready to go. Right, And then we put the fuse two in the pockets and we typically do with carded teeth a couple at a time. And we tack it with the tack light we provide you know, after wiping off the excess. And then we take fuse three and we paint fuse three around the margins. And we're just using fuse three at this point to seal the margins, use it as an oxygen barrier so that we get a good cure, right? Just around the margins. And what we're doing is covering up the fuse uh, two, or the fuse two uh, bonding resin just as shows up at the margin. Same with mill teeth, right? After fuse one, I'm gonna put fuse two in the pockets. I'm gonna place it, wipe off the excess, tack it with my tack light and then seal right around the margins with our fuse three air barrier. So you can see here this young lady who was a technician had been at the lab for just a few months, right? And so she had done some scanning. She had learned how to design basic um, custom trays, things like that. But in one day, right, we had her trained to run the printer, do the cleaning process, do the assembly process. And so she, in one day, learned how to handle three of the five steps associated with this denture manufacturer. That frees up the skill text to go do more dentures and do other things. And just imagine, you know, as you scale up, how easy it's going to be, you know, to hire somebody and train somebody to do this. Never do I intend or would want to intend replacing anybody, right? But we all know that finding a tooth setter or finding a finisher or anything like that, it gets harder and harder. And this makes me more comfortable to know that I can find people in the future, you know, to scale up. Now, Having said all that with carded and mill teeth, most people are printing teeth these days, right? Because it's so easy to have just 16 shades of material, not have to worry about, you know, drawers and drawers of teeth or, or having 16 a quality, a, a quantity of pucks. With printed teeth, um, we don't use Fuse 1. Remember, Fuse uh, 1 is used to condition something that's already been processed, like a carded tooth or a mill PMMA puck. With a printed tooth, it's not processed until we process it in the curing unit. So it doesn't need to be conditioned. So we cut that step out completely, which is the time savings, of course. And we go straight after dry fitting to fuse two in the pockets, uh, seat, wipe excess, and tack, tack with our tack light, right? And then uh, one thing different with fuse three is that we paint the fuse three over the entire surface of that tooth right? Because it's more than just the fuse two at the margin that's uncooked. It is the, the printed tooth. So we paint it over the whole surface of the tooth to create a good air barrier, right? And so in doing that, right, um, this is uh, two of those arches that I seated or, the, or, or did the dry fit for seven arches earlier. So this is two of them. And you can see that all I'm doing is putting fuse two in the pockets, you know, wiping off excess, cleaning it up, and then tacking it with the tack light. The tack light's not curing it. It's just kind of setting it so that the teeth will stay in place until I get to the curing unit, right? So in this case, you know, it was just, you know, four segments per arch. And you can do this in five to six minutes as opposed to, you know, 12 to 15 with the other method. So there, the fuse three, right? I'm painting it over all the surfaces of the teeth. And that takes, you know, a minute. So once that's done, right, it, it's ready to be cured, right? And this is kind of what it looks like. So the teeth are shiny, they look good. And then after the curing unit, right, it comes out and it looks like this. And so you got to, you know, do your finishing and polishing like you always do with denture base to smooth down all those nibs from the supports and uh, contour lines from the printer, those things. Now, we introduced a Fuse 3 Total, a new version of Fuse 3. And Fuse 3 Total was introduced when we introduced the premium tooth resin because the original Fuse 3 was designed only to be that air barrier. Now, it worked well as a, a sealer for the printed teeth, but it was a little thick, thicker than we would like it, and it wasn't always crystal clear. And so we went back to the drawing board. We improved Fuse 3, uh, made it a different chemical, um, thinner, uh, crystal clear, and um, it also now has a glaze factor associated with it. So when you paint it on the premium tooth, and it is absolutely required for the premium tooth resin, um, and I like to use it for everything now, but when you paint it on the tooth and uh, put it in the curing unit, this, this sealer actually is cured with the teeth in the base. So it is literally baked into the surface. You know, it actually goes in a few microns, right? So this is unlike any other denture glaze we've ever used. 
you know, you know, things like OptiGlaze and like that, they're great. They make dentures look great. They're easy to apply. Um, but in time, because they're literally a shellac type material, you know, they run a high risk of changing color or cracking or peeling off and has to be redone. This material is not just on the surface. It is actually cured during the curing of the denture. So it's baked in, you know, much like a porcelain uh, crown would be. So when I saw this and I saw how good it looked on the teeth, uh, you know, I wanted to know, can I use it on the base? And the engineer said, of course you can. And so I immediately went to that workflow where um, after I tacked the teeth down, um, I painted over the teeth and the base. Now that requires me to smooth that base before I seat the teeth, right? So when I'm smoothing those nibs off the bottom of the teeth, I'm also smoothing my printer nibs off the denture base. Right, so that it's it's pretty much done, and you know that requires a little bit extra time with the handpiece, and you know rinsing all the dust off with water. But once I've done that, then I will tack the teeth down with the fuse two, and then I'll take the fuse three total and paint it everywhere. So the dentures that you see in my pictures that are really really shiny, um, that's done that way. Right, when you do it that way, um, there is no pumice bench or polishing needed, and which to me is a big win because I'm one of the worst polisher ever, right? I'm always pumicing off a, a, a gingival margin on a tooth. But after we paint that on, we go in the curing unit and uh, push go, right? And this is our um, newest curing unit um, that is available now. And again, 90 minutes, um, and it'll do up to nine dentures. This newer curing unit, um, again, coming out in Chicago is only about three grand and will hold up to five dentures and we'll cure them in 60 minutes. So options, right? It's all about having options. So if you don't want to use the shiny stuff on the gingiva, that's okay, right? You, you shine up the teeth with the glaze, you cure the denture, and this is what you see after the cure. And then you just use traditional workflows to polish that gingiva up, like we've always done with acrylic. You just have to be careful not to hit the teeth, right? Because otherwise you're going to have to polish them as well. And you can see here on that number nine that I actually nicked that a little bit with a buff wheel. So I had to go back and repolish that spot. But this is what I would use is just carbides just to knock down the big spots. Mostly use those buff wheels, the three uh, medium fine and extra fine buff wheels like from you know, 3M or Nexus, and then a polycryl or a pumice, and then a dry shine, like we've always done with acrylic. And so this has kind of been that workflow with our product forever, right? Smooth it up, smooth it up some more with some buff wheels, go over to the pumice bench and get it even smoother and then polish it. I've kind of moved away from the a lathe and into a handpiece mode because there are enough tools out there now that I can do very similar processes, but just sitting down with a handpiece, right, and get into tighter spots. So um, we have documentation that will show you how to do both ways. If you want to use the, the Fuse 3 Total to put that glaze on it, or if you want to polish it traditionally, all this is in this document, which, you know, just ask our reps and you can get that. Customization is certainly possible. Um, these two materials have been validated with our resins. If you're going to use, um, you know, the Gradia or the uh, Annex Dent to, you know, customize your gingiva, you want to do this after the denture is cured, um, and then you would place these and cure these according to their specifications and with their curing unit. You can't put this on before you put it in our curing unit because, again, with the temperature, it gets way too hot for these materials uh, in its onset stage. So uh, I would do that after the fact. Repairs, yes, it's repairable with acrylic. Um, but I like to use the Fuse products because it's similar, same shade, and the strengths are a little better. But you can use cold cure acrylic. It sticks to our stuff pretty good. And you know, cold cure acrylic and pressure pot is what we know. And you can certainly repair LDP with that. Same is true for relines. We actually validated our cold cure, the HIPAA, and to be used as a reline material with traditional workflows. If you want to do a soft reline, you have to use a chair side. And these two are validated, the soft three line from Tokiyama and the GC soft three line materials. Both are validated and stick really well to loose tone digital print. So options, guys, it's all about options, right? You wanna be able to create whatever type of denture you want, economy grade, medium grade, high grade, super high grade, and having all these options of resins, you know, a pretty good resin, a really good resin, a pretty good library, a really good library, uh, just gives you these options. And somebody asked me, what does that mean? And I said, well, this is what I would do, right? I would use a combination of resin and libraries and, you know, maybe design text, right? If you look at this denture, look at the gingiva. You know, we would call that in the analog world, you know, slick it because I don't want you to spend a lot of time creating festooning anatomy because I sell this at 
hundred bucks, right? So I can't spend a lot of time on it. I can do the same thing digitally, right? Um, so I don't, you know, need a really skilled person that knows how to do that festooning. And because the doctor wants, you know, a hundred dollar denture, better, you know, you step up your game a little bit, do a little bit more design work, use the better resin, the better libraries, and then you could go all the way to the top and use the best designer and the best uh, libraries and and the best resins. And so you have these options to create these tiers with this system. And these workflows exist. Um, we're running out of time. So, you know, I'm not going to go through these, but just know that copy dentures, immediate dentures, and even some implant workflows are certainly possible with the Lucitone digital print system. Uh, I want to make sure I have time to answer your questions. There's that QR code again, um, you know, to get to that portal, I call it, so that you can have access to all this data. Um, let's see. All right, so last thing I wanted to get back to, all right, we talked about this, right? What does it mean, analog? We know that, we know that cost. If I translate that to digital, what does that mean? Well, um, you know, these salaries may not, these are way low for where we were at our lab, but these are, I got these directly off the LMT uh, lab survey every time they do it every two years. And so just to give us a, a, you know, a ground level, but notice number one, the time. We went from you know, an hour and a half, hour 45, down to just over an hour. And this is being very generous. I think it's a little better than that. And in reality, what that means, the same five technicians, if I just teach them different skill sets to do different things, right? You know, I don't need an investor processor, I need somebody to run the printer, right? You know, I don't need a waxer, I, I need somebody to design. So the waxer, you know, goes and learns how to uh, scan and design, right? I need a scanner, not a model person. I mean, not a waxer as much. It, it just kind of transfer tasks around. But if you do all the math with the timing and everything, it basically meant the same five technicians they did 24 arches a day analog. Now they can do 30 a day, right? And so just you do the math on your cost and profit, what that means, but just per unit, per denture, right? You know, compared to analog, we're already, you remember what it was? Um, let's go back and look at that. So profit was 192 with my analog. If I charge 301 again, now my profit went up, you know, over 10 bucks a denture, but I'm doing six more dentures a day. Right, that adds up. But if I start using loose stone digital value for my tooth material, look how my cost drops in material, my profit goes up. But if I want to use a premium, it, it's still a big win, right? And that's the big win. Your tooth printed tooth resins, now that we have one that's as good as a carded portrait, um, but at a significantly reduced cost, right? It's $12 an arch, guys. $12 an arch for digital IP and tooth resin, $6 an arch for loose stone digital value resin. You know, that's a huge win for you to be able to add to your profit margin. And all you did was change materials. So this is a huge win. I saw this as a huge win. I, I, you know, I think you could create a digital denture lab with as few as two or three people and still make good money um, because of the workflow time savings you know, and material costs. So um, the QR code here will get you my contact info. And um, it's, you know, I got you know, five minutes to try to answer questions. Um, Jimmy, so, thank you so much. We do have one question coming up, and the person wants to know if the curing unit is that an absolute must to use with this Lucitone digital print. Unfortunately, yes, um, and, and that's always been a stickling point because you know none of us want to have to buy a curing unit for material we use. But unfortunately, you know our guys didn't want to say that. Our, our product developers tested. Um, I think they told me once 19 different commercially available curing units, and none of them have the ability, all of them have the light wavelength, that's not an issue, but none of them have the heat ability to get that temperature, none of them will get to 180 degrees anywhere near it, even some of the older things that we had, so as much as we'd love to say, yeah, go use this one, or if you have this one, that works, unfortunately, no, you have to use one of our curing units, whether it's the original speed cure, the large capacity are the one coming in Chicago called the Lucitone Digital Cure. And again, the price point for the Speed Cure, which we don't, uh, or we aren't making any more of those, but it, there may be a few available around nine grand, eight or nine grand. The uh, large capacity is five grand and the new unit will be coming out around three grand. Excellent. The next question is about the viscosity. They want to know, is that the reason why you don't need to shake it or put it on a roller? Are there no other additives that are added to this particular resin like color? Um, no, um, I mean, you know, the scientists aren't going to give away all their secrets. <laughs> and I'm sure there's some things in there to help with stability and whatnot. But um, 
with the base resin, I've left it in the printer tray for a couple of weeks and I see nothing um, changing with it. You know, you always want to mix it a little bit with the spatula, but uh, the premium tooth resin, if it's been in the printer for 10 days, I do see the edge uh, in the liquid uh, around the edge in the printer tray look a little bit darker. So I always mix it then, but for the most part, no, the, the viscosity and perhaps some chemistry in there keeps it stable so we don't have to shake it. Excellent. If anybody else has any other questions, now would be the time to just type them into the Q&A section. Um, just want to let everybody know that Jimmy did mention that he will be joining us in the uh, Grand Ballroom ENF, that's the Zahn Grand Ballroom, uh, for two table clinics. One will be on Friday and one will be on Saturday. So if you want to get up close and personal with Lucidone uh, Digital Print, please register. Um, registration is open for those table clinics as uh, well as all the other education and table clinics that Zom will be offering. I just want to go over uh, upcoming uh, education. We're going to have next Wednesday, that is January 25th, 2 p.m. Eastern, the first part of a three-part series with Dora Rodriguez uh, on denture conversions. The first part, she will be discussing analog process and implementation. Um, just in case you want to get started with di uh, Lucitone Digital Print, and you need some new equipment to do so, now would be the time to take a look and maybe get in touch with your Zon representative about financing options that are available. Uh, the one that comes to mind that I really love is Route 66 uh, because it does not require any payments for six months. So if you decided that this is what you wanted to do and you wanted to order some equipment, you wouldn't need to start paying until July. So the equipment gets working for you and Again, you wouldn't have to pay anything until July with no interest. Um, we do have another question, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. Okay, they wanna know if this recording will be available to watch again, and I can answer that. Absolutely, it will be. And you will be getting an email to let you know that it will be available as well as taking a look on YouTube. YouTube will have it in the next couple of days. So I think that's it for the questions for today. Jimmy, thank you so much for joining us here on Zon Academy and we'd like to thank all of our attendees as well. And hopefully we'll see you live in Chicago. Have a great day, everybody.